Okay guys, in this video I will discuss about the anatomy of this particular steel structure and in the due course of this video you will understand why different type of connection and different type of arrangement has been used throughout this structure. Okay, and before diving into the detail of this video I just would like to thank you and to the new members welcome again to this premium group. Okay. So let's start today's anatomy of this particular structure. Okay, so here you can see this is a steel structure and the special type of bracing arrangement has been used. Okay, why this is special? Because you know that in braced frame we normally used this particular type of arrangement where these are the pin joint and either we have a diagonal bracing like this or we have a cross bracing like this or we may have a chevron bracing arrangement like this okay but here you can see the bracing arrangement is quite different okay here you can see that these are the bracing arrangement for this particular type of steel structure okay if you observe closely if we consider all this three way this is the first way this is the second and this is the third one in each and every way you can see that the bracing arrangement is like this this is one bracing this is one and this is another okay now this frame ends here and these are another two bracing at the bottom tire of the structure so basically you can see that we have instead of having two separate member we have multiple number of bracing this is one this is one and at the top tire we have used this is one and this is number two and finally this is number three okay so basically your structure has formed a you can say a large truss at the top tire and at the bottom a braced frame okay now why this type of structure has been made first consider the dead load or the live load or the vertical load okay so to transfer the vertical load that are coming from this pipe or the dead weight or any type of live load uh, you can see these are the pipes this is also another pipe we have used a moment frame here you can see so if this is the uh, line diagram this is the tire here is the pipe here is the pipe okay so due to all this dead load here you can see that they have actually used a moment frame here you can see this is the moment connection okay so this is the column and this is another column okay and this is the big beam with stiffener here and here and here and also we have stiffener at the end or at this connection joint okay so definitely this particular beam column structure is a moment frame and it can uh, dedicately carry all this vertical load okay and also if there is any lateral load coming like this as this beam is connected with all this column by moment connection it can easily carry all this lateral load also okay now come to the uh, lateral load that is coming longitudinally due to this pipe friction load okay if you simply consider this top large diameter pipe here definitely this pipe is connected with this rack by using a shoe here you can see this is the shoe okay so whenever there is a operational load due to this friction you will have some frictional forces acting like this each and every node so just consider this particular frame we have one node two nodes three and four so at all this four point we have some lateral load okay and this lateral load first come to this node then as you have provided this bracing the transfer to this particular bracing and come to this node right then to reach this bracing what they have to do this have to travel this particular long beam then they come to this foundation so 
you have transferred this top lateral load to, to this foundation by this particular path. Okay. Now, let us say you have some uh, lateral load acting in this point. How it is going to transfer to this foundation? Very simple. It will come to the nearest bracing. In this case, this one. Okay. So, this is the nearest bracing. It will come to this point. Then, go to the foundation. Let us say you have lateral load in this point. In that case, it will go to this particular point because this is the nearest bracing. Just like this, here also the lateral load come to this point, then to this bracing, finally to the foundation. If you have at the top, you have some lateral load here also, it go to this point, then to this bracing, then from this point, it travels this long beam, then finally go to foundation like this. Okay. So, you have understood the basic idea behind this type of arrangement. Okay. So, you can see that this particular point and also this particular point, if there is any lateral load, they can travel to this foundation or to this foundation by means of this bracing and by this bracing. Okay. So, at the top tire, these two bracing were sufficient. These two bracing were sufficient. Now, my question is, why this bracing has been provided okay let me clear this picture here it is so my question is that these two particular bracing at the top tire were sufficient to transfer any lateral load just like this or just like this now why this bracing member has been provided what is the purpose you can see here that it is not carrying any lateral load. Then why this all this member, this one and in this case, this one and uh, if you take a closer look to this one and finally here also. So why this extra money has been spent to construct this particular member. Okay. So just pause this video and try to think yourself why some engineers or some company use extra money to construct a member which is not carrying any load at all. Okay, to understand or to make sure that you get the correct point, I just need to go back to your college days. Okay, so can you remember this particular problem, the famous problem from Hebler structural engineering book? Yes, is it stable? At the very first chapter where the stability of trusses were discussed, from there it has been taken. And you know, if you can recall that there was a problem like this, that whether this truss is stable or not. So, if you know the answer of this particular question, then you also know why this particular extra member has been provided in this structure. Okay. So, assuming you do not know the answer, well, I am just copying the answer from the Hebler. Okay. It is clearly stated there that in addition to the external stability of any truss, we also need to examine the internal stability too. And when a truss is not internally stable, very simple. If you do not follow a simple principle, that is to form any truss, you have to start from a triangular shape. Then if you add two member, you can only have a single joint. That is the basic rule of internal stability and only in that case any truss is internally stable. Here you can see in this particular truss, we have started with this triangular shape, then if we have add two rigid member, we have a single joint. Here also, this is one member, this is another member, this is a single joint, this is one member, this is one member, this is a single joint, then this is one and this is one, we have a single joint. Finally, this is one member and this is one member, this is a single joint. But in this particular case, what has been done? Let us say we have started with this triangular form. Okay. So, this was our elementary triangular shape. Now, we have add two member here. We have a single joint. It is okay. But here you can see that we have add one member and one joint. There is no member here. 
as a result what will happen this particular portion of this truss will rotate or collapse internally under any type of loading so to make it stable what you have to do you have to simply put a restraint by providing a diagonal member like this you don't need to provide two member here here a single member is sufficient here you don't need two member one member is sufficient but here you cannot have empty space you have to provide a diagonal member to make it stable internally okay now i think it is clear to you why you have provided this extra diagonal member to this particular structure just to follow this very basic principle that's it